decades before 9-11, the United States is attacked by terrorists. American businesses are bombed. Innocent people are slaughtered. Symbols of liberty become targets for destruction. The terrorists are mobile, well-organized, and deadly. As the violence escalates, their victims have but one hope, the FBI. In the 1970s, cities across the United States became a battleground for vicious Croatian radicals. Their violent agenda targeted their own people living in America. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents all over the country worked to unravel a complex web of extortions, bombings, and assassinations. At stake were the lives of innocent Croatian families trying to build a new life in America. New York City, 1977. On the morning of June 14th, three men approached the Yugoslav diplomatic mission to the United Nations. Outside the mission, a New York City police officer stands guard. Inside, Yugoslav security agents protect the embassy. One of them asks the visitors for identification. Go, go. Hearing the shot, police officers rush into the building. Foreign missions are technically outside the NYPD's jurisdiction. The officers are now in Yugoslav territory. As backup arrives, the officers inside the mission try to negotiate with the three men, but they have barricaded themselves in an upper office. The intruders warn they have taken a woman hostage. They will kill her if anyone tries to enter. One officer offers himself as a substitute hostage. Take me for the hostage. The gunmen refuse. Agents from the FBI's New York field office respond to the scene. According to federal law, the FBI is responsible for investigating all attacks on foreign missions. Special Agent Len Cross. As I arrived, we had police officers in the park. We had police officers on surrounding buildings with uh, scoped rifles. And then we had the uh, emergency service units making entry into the building. What was going through my mind was, you know, what was happening on the inside. The suspects appear in an upstairs window brandishing a Croatian flag. They toss propaganda leaflets into the street. The leaflets call on the United Nations to force communist Yugoslavia to grant Croatia its independence. What they were trying to do was gain publicity for their cause and showing the oppressive regime that existed in Yugoslavia and how they were oppressing the Croatian people. A hostage negotiator talks to the suspects for nearly two hours. They finally agree to come out but only if they are taken into custody by U.S. authorities, not Yugoslav officials. They were just trying to protect themselves from the officials because they knew if, uh, if they got their hands on them, they'd kill them. Easy. And then finally, when they realized it was the New York City police, and the FBI on the other side of the door and assured them that no harm would come to them, they surrendered uh, without incident. The suspects reveal that they never had a hostage. They were only bluffing to prevent Yugoslav security agents from mounting an armed assault. As the police officers escort the suspects out of the building, mission security confronts them. It 
and tell the officers to hand over the radicals. This is Yugoslavian mission. You have no right here. This is territory of Yugoslavia. Put the guns down. The NYPD officers refuse. Prisoners, step aside. No. Lower your weapon. They intend to leave the mission with the prisoners. We're taking our prisoners out. Lower the guns. The security agents finally back down. The invasion of a foreign mission on U.S. soil is unprecedented. One of their employees has been seriously wounded. Special Agent Cross now leads the investigation. He searches for a possible motive for the attack. He starts by analyzing the long history of hatred and violence between Yugoslav Serbs and Croatians as they fought over the same Eastern European lands. The reasons and motives stretched centuries where Serbians would go into Croatian villages and kill every man, woman, and child, and the Croatians would reciprocate. 1971, the violence spread outside Yugoslavia. Croatian radicals assassinated the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden. In 1972, they hijacked a Swedish airliner and forced the government to release seven political prisoners from jail. Later that same year, Croatian terrorists claimed responsibility for planting a bomb on board a Yugoslav airliner. The blast killed 26 innocent people. I mean, the, the hatred was so deep and it was hard to fathom. We were dealing also with trying to understand culture, cultural uh, and historical issues. And, and it was not your simple uh, criminal matter. And it was a lot of payback on both sides. Now, that payback is spread from Europe to the United States. It's a terrifying trend. Cross contacts fellow FBI agents at US embassies around the world. They confirm that there has been a disturbing increase in Croatian attacks on Yugoslav embassies and diplomats worldwide. Special Agent Cross works closely with police and prosecutors, providing background information on the men who attacked the Yugoslav mission. Four months later, on October 13th, a New York jury finds all three men guilty of conspiring to take hostage Yugoslavia's ambassador to the United Nations. The jury also convicts the gunman who wounded the Yugoslav security agent of assault with a deadly weapon. For Agent Cross, the case is officially closed. But everything he has learned tells him that Croatian terrorism in the United States is on the rise and about to explode. Nine months later, in Chicago, Cross's fears become a grim reality. Croatian businessmen begin calling the FBI in a panic. They have each received an anonymous letter written in Serbo-Croatian. The letters demand a large sum of money and threatens horrific consequences if the recipient fails to pay up. Special Agent Bjarn Borison of the FBI's Chicago field office examines the letters. Yesterday. Borison speaks fluent Serbo-Croatian and has a background in counterintelligence. They said, you are not doing your part in our cause to overthrow the communist government. We've assessed your situation and decided that you are capable of paying this amount of money. And they would instruct them to send this money to an address in Paraguay. And if you fail to do that, you'll pay the consequences. It's absolute extortion. That's the way the FBI looked at it, was, yeah, this was an extortion attempt, and they were threatening your well-being if you didn't cooperate. Agents are unsure whether the culprits are Serb spies or Croatian criminals. But they do know the extortionists have cast a wide net. Nationwide, the FBI collects a total of 52 extortion letters from Croatian businessmen. The letters are nearly identical, but with one key exception. The senders demand a different amount of money from each victim. Most of the people who received those extortion letters were well off, or at least comfortable individuals, and had the ability to pay that money that was requested. In New York City, Special Agent Len Cross heads the investigation into the extortion letters. Searching for leads, he contacts Pero Vuchas, a prominent Croatian political writer living in Queens. 
he was known to be against violence and we felt that he might be an individual who could perhaps assist us in terms of identifying who may be responsible for these letters. Agent Cross asks Vuchas if he thinks the extortionists could be fellow Croatians. He did not feel any good Croatian would have written these letters uh, and made the demands that were made in these letters. Instead, Vuchas blames the Serb government of Yugoslavia. He told me that it was his belief that these letters were generated by the Yugoslavian intelligence service to try to disrupt the Croatian community. The majority were peaceful, and they wanted to uh, overthrow the Yugoslav government, but by peaceful means. But there was always those who wanted to use more violent means and would do anything to achieve that, that, that goal. Vucic believes the letters are an attempt by Serbian spies to sabotage Croatian demands for freedom. I left him my card, told him if he could think of anything else, please just to give me a call, and um, we would appreciate it. In Chicago, Agent Borison focuses on the letter's demand to send money to a post office box in the South American country of Paraguay. The address in Paraguay was of key significance to us because somebody had to collect that money, so they had to zero in on who that might be. The FBI sends an agent from the U.S. Embassy in Argentina to Paraguay to investigate. The agent observes a man receiving the money. He is later identified as a known Croatian terrorist who in 1972 had shot the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden. A month later, in New York City, the case takes a dramatic turn. A man calls local news stations claiming two bombs have been planted in New York City, one at the United Nations, the other at Grand Central Station. In 1978, the FBI investigates a group of Croatian terrorists who use extortion to fund their cause. In New York, two local television stations receive a call from a man who claims two bombs have been planted in New York City. One is at the United Nations. Outside a library at the UN compound, a police officer finds a suspicious looking bag. The officer immediately calls in the NYPD bomb squad. Investigators find a note nearby written in Serbo Croatian. It demands Croatian independence and says, quote, This is the beginning. Our decision is kamikaze. Bomb technicians carefully dismantle the device. It's armed with dynamite and a blasting cap. The timer is set to explode within the hour. It was designed to go off, it's just that it malfunctioned. At Grand Central Station, police find the second bomb stashed inside a locker. Again, the device is accompanied by a letter demanding Croatian independence. If either of the devices had detonated, the loss of life and property would have been disastrous. The writing was on the wall. Things are becoming more and more violent, and they were happening more frequently. The FBI believes it's only a matter of time before someone is killed. Uh, you can go ahead and have a seat, get comfortable. So, with the Agents from the New York field office combined forces. We felt that it would be a good idea to bring all the case agents together on one squad under one supervisor where we could exchange and coordinate our activities. Special Agent Cross also proposes the coordination of a nationwide effort. If we did not, my prediction was that uh, all hell was going to break loose. Two weeks later, in a wealthy suburb of New York, a successful businessman is gunned down outside his own home. His only crime, he's a Croatian immigrant who refused to submit to extortion. The FBI's worst fears have been realized. An extortion target has been murdered, and agents have no viable leads. 
In Chicago, Special Agent Bjorn Borison becomes concerned that Croatian Americans in his area will also be targeted. It wasn't an empty threat they made in that extortion letter. They meant it. And we didn't know who they'd come after, so we had to contact all those individuals who'd received those letters to warn them and advise them they could be a possible target. And at the same time, try to identify who's responsible. The FBI also alerts other law enforcement agencies to watch for anyone purchasing illegal weapons or bomb-making materials. A few days later, the Chicago field office receives a call from the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. A known Croatian radical is trying to buy dynamite. They had just got an individual in a sting operation who had purchased uh, two cases of dynamite from them. This individual met with the ATF undercover agents thinking he was buying real dynamite, but they actually sold him dummy dynamite. The buyer's name is Ivo Afinic. He is a high-ranking member of a Croatian independence group called Otpur. Obviously, they have plans to do a lot more bombs, and that's why they were buying this. The name of the organization is Hrvatski Narodni Otpor, which means Croatian National Resistance. So the word Otpor means resistance. While the majority of Otpor members are law-abiding citizens, the FBI suspects that there may be a criminal faction operating within the organization intent on extorting and murdering fellow Croatians. The, uh, all right, guys, we're gonna pop this door, we're gonna go in. We got some, uh, Otpour meets at a Croatian social club on the south side of Chicago. In a joint operation, FBI and ATF agents raid the club, searching for bomb-making materials. Investigators find the two cases of fake dynamite but there are no live explosives anywhere in the club. A thorough search fails to turn up enough evidence to press charges against Evo a finish. That same day, in a nearby Chicago neighborhood, Daniel Nikolic opens up his shop. Nikolic is one of dozens of Croatian-American businessmen who have received an extortion letter. The cabinet maker refused to be bullied. Chicago police, the Chicago Fire Department, ATF agents, and the FBI investigate. We did a search of the premises, and we determined that a bomb had been detonated on the roof of the cabinet shop. Special Agent Borison interviews Daniel Nikolic. There was no doubt who he thought was responsible, and that was the Opor leadership, as a result of his failure to pay the extortion error that he received. With Nikolic's help, the FBI talks to members of the Croatian community. Their top priority is to find a confidential informant inside Otpur, familiar with the organization's violent activities. The key to almost any investigation is you have to develop someone inside the organization who's willing to cooperate with you. But the Chicago FBI has trouble finding anyone who will talk about Otpur. About the, uh, Serbian activity. To get someone that was actually inside the group is very hard, because it wasn't that big a group who was actually responsible for the violence. It was a small group. And it's very difficult to find someone inside that small group who's going to cooperate with you. While agents try to recruit an informant in Chicago, Pasadena, California, becomes the group's next target. On the morning of November 22nd, a Croatian businessman steps outside his home and into the gun sights of an assassin. The victim had received an extortion letter five months earlier, but he refused to support the Otpur cause. Local police and the FBI investigate, but they find little evidence. In San Francisco, home to a large Croatian-American population, Agents mount an all-out effort to penetrate Otpur before they kill again. The FBI assigns Special Agent Bob Gorth, who speaks fluent Serbo-Croatian, to the full-time task of recruiting a confidential informant. The FBI was having a problem with penetrating the Croatian community for the same reason that uh, you have trouble in any ethnic terrorist field. The criminal act is a result of their nationalism. Whether or not they're involved, they will stand together as a community against 
law enforcement. With a background in Yugoslavian counterintelligence, Special Agent Gorth understands the bitter conflict between the Croatians and the Serbs. Not as often as I can. Uh, Yugoslavia was an artificial country. It uh, uh, was born after World War I. The Croatians fundamentally were constantly fighting to get out from under what they considered Serb domination. His understanding of the culture helps him enter San Francisco's Croatian community. I was very unbureau in a way. No suit and tie, no anything. A lot of times conversations were over a, over a beer, over a bar table. We had to find a way to, to break down the wall and to convince someone on the inside who had information that what they were doing was morally wrong. It had to be a matter of conscience and a matter of actual conversion of thought. From San Francisco to Chicago to New York, FBI agents compare notes, trying to find an insider who can give them any information on the mysterious tight-knit terror group. The FBI's lead case agent in New York is Len Cross. It was around 6 o'clock at night, and we were going over our leads and trying to get an idea what do we need to do next, and I received a phone call. Agent Cross, for you. He wouldn't say. It sounded urgent. After four months of silence, Pero Vuchas, the Croatian activist writer, is desperate to talk to Cross. And he says, I need to talk to you, and I need to talk to you now. I got a threatening letter, and he says, I'm going to tell you everything. I know who's all responsible. The call may be the break the FBI needs. So I says, OK, I'm, I'm coming right over. I says, I'll meet you right at your house. Other agents from the New York field office accompany Cross to the meeting. They says, no, you're not going, we're going to go with you, because I mean, this could be a setup. They could be trying to get you. Nationwide, FBI agents try to infiltrate a deadly terrorist organization that extorts and murders their fellow Croatian immigrants. Pero Vuchas, a Croatian political writer, Ask Special Agent Len Cross to come to his house. He's finally willing to talk. He was very concerned, very scared, and he proceeded to show me this letter. It was essentially telling him that if he didn't shut up and didn't get his act together, that uh, something very bad was going to happen to him. He realized at this point that these guys meant business and that he was in their crosshairs. And that his only alternative was to reach out to the FBI you know, put his trust in them that they can get the job done. The writer tells Agent Cross that he believes members of Otpur are behind the letters and the violence. And he says they're criminals, they're just a bunch of criminals uh, that have infiltrated the, the Croatian organizations. At that point, he laid it out who all the king players were throughout the country. He couldn't tell us who wrote their letters. But what he did tell us is these are the guys that are running the whole operation. According to Vuchas, Otpor's North American headquarters is in Chicago. Some of the key terrorists live in the Midwestern United States. It was really good information and, and definitely kind of was starting to fill in the puzzle. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Agents contact a Croatian priest who the FBI learns is influential throughout the Midwestern Croatian community. Sit down. Please. Father Bradish is an outspoken opponent of violence. Agents believe he may provide valuable leads. An FBI agent from the Milwaukee field office interviews him at the Catholic elementary school where he works. As they talk, Father Bradish opens his mail. One package contains a book. The agent spots a wire. He observed batteries, wires, and explosives. The agent, being concerned for the, the location that it was in an elementary school with young kids, grabbed the book, and he ran outside. The Milwaukee police sends a bomb technician to disable the device. Tragically, the blasting cap explodes, taking off part of the technician's hand. The FBI issues a warning to the 52 extortion victims that they've identified across the country. Beware of book-sized packages wrapped in brown paper. 
the next day in Queens, New York. Peiro Vuchas picks up his mail. Inside his post office box, he finds a note telling him that he has a package. The postal worker can't find it. No, please, will you look one more time? It has to be here. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. The package has been stored on a shelf near the counter. It looks like a book. I don't want it. I'll come back for it later. Vuchas contacts Special Agent Len Cross. I received a call telling me, I've got a bomb. It's at the post office. He says, you want me to go get it? I says, no, leave it there. I says, we're going to get the bombs. What? We'll take it from there. At the FBI lab, a bomb expert studies the package. It is nearly identical to a device sent to Milwaukee. This book bomb uh, was very similar in construction. The uh, cutout looked the same. The firing system was the same. It was the same type of dynamite, same type of blasting cap. The postmarks on the packaging reveal that both bombs were mailed from Akron, Ohio on the same day. Agents alert Ohio authorities of the likelihood that the bomb maker lives in their area. In Cleveland, police search the home of Pavel Chotoras. The Croatian radical is their chief suspect in the bombing of a Croatian bookstore five days earlier. Spread it out a little bit. Special Agent Bjarn Borison. During the search, they found a book that was hollowed out and was obviously a book bomb. The bomb is a prototype. Once again, there are no live explosives on the premises. Without further evidence, no arrest can be made. Investigators try to link the prototype to the book bombs mailed to Milwaukee and Queens. Every bomb maker has his own unique style. And of course, one of the reasons for doing that is safety. You want to do it the same way every time, because if you've changed anything, it's very dangerous to wire a book bomb. In the lab, Special Agent Denny Klein compares all three devices. Each book is hollowed out to the same depth. The glue and solder used to construct the devices each have the same chemical composition. Even minute tool marks on the bomb's wiring match. The belief of the laboratory was that this was a prototype uh, that was used to make the uh, two earlier bombs. There is no way to know how many more bombs have been constructed from the prototype. March 17, 1980. New Yorkers and tourists pack Fifth Avenue to watch the city's annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. 10.55 AM. A bomb explodes at the 30th floor office of a Yugoslav bank. FBI agents respond, including Special Agent Ken Maxwell. We were doing interviews of the, um, uh, the employees of the bank, the employees of the neighboring offices, the maintenance people in the building, delivery people, anybody who would even come remotely close to 505th Avenue that day. The only significant evidence agents find is another note in which Oatpour claims responsibility. The terrorists issue a chilling threat. The bomb attacks will continue until Croatia is free. On June 3, 1980, the terrorists target one of America's most cherished symbols of freedom, the Statue of Liberty. On June 3, 1980, Croatian terrorists target one of America's most cherished symbols of freedom, the Statue of Liberty. Special Agent Ken Maxwell helps investigate the bombing. Someone had gotten into what they called the museum story room at the base of the statue that tells you the whole history of how the statue was built and all of the wonderful history in the pictures, and plus the souvenir shop. All of that had been blown to smithereens. A considerable amount of damage had been done uh, throughout the base of the statue. 
A number of violent groups claim responsibility for the bombing, including the Palestinian Liberation Organization, anti-Castro Cubans, and even neo-Nazis. Multiple claims of credit back in the early 80s was not an unusual phenomenon. Investigators painstakingly search for pieces of the bomb, expecting that the evidence will help them determine which group is responsible. Hey, guys, looks like I got a wire over here. We spent all night there sifting through all of the rubble and debris and came up with quite a few components. The components of the improvised explosive device were strikingly similar to previous Croatian-related bombings. What began as an attempt to extort dozens of Croatian Americans has escalated into a campaign of violence. The Statue of Liberty was the greatest symbol of attraction for potential terrorists because of what it stood for. In their mind, the United States was not um, listening to their cause. So let's bring the cause to their attention and let's show them, the United States, that this is a real issue to us and almost trying to uh, extort the United States of America to help them achieve independence. But the terrorists' logic is flawed. The attack only fuels authorities to intensify their investigation. Nice. Bombing our Statue of Liberty it's a slap in the face. So what we did, we started to focus our resources, our investigative attention on several individuals who we strongly suspected were involved in this kind of activity. In New York, the FBI sets up intensive surveillance on several key terror suspects. In San Francisco, FBI Special Agent Bob Gorth continues his efforts to recruit an informant inside the terrorist ring. I spent over a year doing nothing but contacting Croatians. It's very important to understand the people, to speak their language, to understand where they come from, even to a degree to empathize with them so that you can talk to them in terms that they understand and appreciate. I interviewed over 300, I think, of all stripes and persuasions and types trying to find the right source. I finally found a man who uh, indicated he'd like to talk again. Hadn't told me anything, but he'd like to talk again. After talking to him, I don't know how many times, we began to build a rapport. And finally he, he said, I think I, I'll help. Finding a source of information inside Otpor is a major break for the FBI. After thoroughly debriefing the informant in San Francisco, the FBI sends him to New York to gather intelligence on the most recent Croatian bombings. He originally had lived in New York, and uh, he was well acquainted with the people. The informant renews old friendships with Croatian radicals. He would have been killed if members of Otpor Command had found out that he was a man. Despite the risk, he probes for details about their plans. If you could obtain inside information on what's going on in a criminal enterprise, it means a tremendous amount in terms of achieving success in an investigation. The informant learns that the group intends to assassinate an outspoken critic of Otpur. Take care of it. The target is Pero Vuchas, the prominent Croatian political writer. They were going to kill him uh, with a, a rifle as he was walking his daughter, to, his six-year-old daughter, to school in the morning. If they missed, they could hit his six-year-old daughter. Uh, they had no concern for her, and uh, most of the agents and the detectives uh, working this case, they all had kids. So, you know, they were thinking in terms of a father. How could they do such a thing like this? According to the informant, the ruthless plot is already in motion. Special Agent Ken Maxwell watches as two suspected terrorists park a van near the target's home. What was very unusual is that they got out of the front of the van and went in, th in the back of the van 
removed one of the rear windows and substituted one of the windows with a cardboard panel. And although we could not see totally inside the van, we did know they weren't having a bagel and coffee in the back of that van. They were looking to assassinate him. In New York, agents believe Croatian assassins intend to shoot Pero Vucas as he walks his six-year-old daughter to school. Vucas has been working with the FBI to identify the terrorists. Special Agent Len Cross warns Vucas to stay inside his apartment. If they had made an attempt to get out of the car and proceed to his residence, then we saw what would appear to be a weapon. There was no if, ands, or buts. They were going to be taken down, period. Fortunately, Vucas and his daughter remain hidden, forcing the snipers to abandon their deadly plot. The FBI decides to set up electronic surveillance on a man they believe to be the mastermind behind the East Coast bombings, the president of Otpur, Stepan Sacic. He was directing the operations here in New York and naturally would be the place to, to put the, uh, the wiretap, especially in view of the fact that uh, the individuals came to him, and that's where they had their meetings. Special Agent Bjarne Borison. It's very difficult to go into a building and place a wire without leaving any trace that you were there, and, uh, and the FBI is quite good at that. Very nearby, we set up a listening post, and we'd have at least one translator there at all times. Their job is to translate Croatian to English, the pieces are the bomb -making. as well as identify each voice on the tape. They must also decipher any code words used by the terrorists. They won't come out and say words like dynamite. They may say things or pieces. The drop-off, which is the device delivery, and the package is the bomb. It took a while for us to get a grasp as to what are they talking about and get the significance of the, of the phraseology they use. The conspirators meet often, usually in the rec room in Sacic's basement. Jako Drevan, one of the men who tried to assassinate Pero Vucas, is Sacic's lieutenant. Translators work day and night analyzing their conversations. The wiretap would run 24 hours a day, and we had to constantly monitor the conversations because they're talking about bombing, assassinating people. Agents are still trying to pin down specifics, places, dates, the identities of the co-conspirators. It was all part of the puzzle that had all the pieces be pulled together in order to form the, enough evidence to start the prosecution. Under federal racketeering laws, the FBI needs hard evidence of a conspiracy to take down the entire organization. Special Agent Ken Maxwell. But one particular night, their shaking of the pinball machine shook loose a wire that was used in the installation of the microphone. It looked like a plain wire. It didn't look like it had a, a head that a normal microphone would have. So if you saw it, you might even know what it is. On the other end, the translators can hear the conspirators talking about the wire. What they were saying was, what is that? And one of them realized rather quickly, because he had done all of the electrical work for the house, I didn't put that wire there. They knew there was something there that didn't belong there. Now, the next question is, do they know what it is? The conspirators begin following the wire. And they trace that wire out of the basement to the power source out on the street and rip the wire out. For the FBI, the tap is critical. To 
the great credit of our special operations folks. They reinstalled, and they reinstalled within 24 hours. I think the bad guys thought they had won in that instance, not realizing our persistence. And this time, we avoided the pinball machine. Agents hear Stepan Sacic and Yako Drevin planning an upcoming operation. They were talking about, let's get ready, I want you to do this, I want you to smash this. And we knew they were getting ready to bomb something. Agents learn that Opor intends to bomb a Yugoslav dance studio, scheduled to host a gala attended by the Yugoslav ambassador to the United Nations, Special Agent Len Cross. They were going to have over 300 people there. At this point, this really raised our concerns because now they're going after groups and not concerned about who gets hurt. Agents tail driven. He drives to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he visits the home of a man named Vuka Yulich. When he went into the residence, he went in empty-handed. When he came out, he had a, a good-sized brown bag, and there seemed to be some bulky stuff inside the bag. Agents follow Drevin back to New York City, where he picks up another Otpur foot soldier. The men drive on toward their target. And they circled a block in Manhattan and kept circling it and circling it. Agents watch as Drevin cases the building. He leaves the suspicious bag behind in the van. It was decided that if they removed the bag, then we were going to arrest them. Certainly, we were not going to take the chance of a potential bombing in midtown Manhattan. As the suspect returns to the van, the agents watch his every move, ready to take the terrorists down. In New York, agents tail two suspected Croatian terrorists. An FBI surveillance operation has revealed that a radical faction of Otpur is planning to place a bomb at a reception for 300 people. The terrorists case the building and then leave the area. Agents suspect that they have a bomb in their van. The FBI cannot risk a terror attack on hundreds of innocent people. Agents obtained search warrants to raid the homes of Stepan Sacic and Yako Drevin. FBI! Up against the wall! In Drevin's home, Special Agent Ken Maxwell finds a familiar looking bag in a closet. When I looked into the shopping bag, I saw a woman's pocketbook that was open. And inside the pocketbook were sticks of dynamite wrapped up in tape, a timing device, of, of, of an alarm clock, an electric blasting cap, and wire. It's not every day that you find a bomb at your feet. Authorities take Drevin into custody. Across town, Special Agent Len Cross and his team search the home of Stepan Sacic, the president of Otpur. One of my uh, team members was going through a pile of paint drop cloths. And he found the scoped rifle, and he found the ammunition. Investigators suspect Sacic's co-conspirators used the rifle weeks earlier in a plot to murder political writer and FBI cooperator Pero Vuchas. Agents arrest Sacic for conspiracy under RICO, the federal racketeering statute. He was advised of his rights, and uh, he, he refused. He wasn't being very cooperative. No, I don't think so. Four days later, <laughs> FBI agents and police raid the Bridgeport, Connecticut home of Vuka Yulich. Towards the window. What is all about? Face the window. Yulich provided Drevin with the bomb earmarked for the dance studio. We have a warrant to search the premises. A bomb tech, as he moved some clothes, observed there on the floor in a bag 
considerable amount of dynamite and sitting on top of the dynamite were electric blasting caps, live electric blasting caps. Agents arrest Vuka Yulich. Don't you worry about it. We'll take care of it from here. Special Agent Cross. They call Special Agent Cross in New York to inform him they have found one of Otpour's primary bomb makers. Special Agent Cross. Cross again questions Stepan Sacic, asking him if he knows a man by the name of Vuka Yulich. He says, yeah, a little I do. I says, you're going to have, you got some problems. And we've just arrested him. And I says, he had a large quantity of explosives and caps and weapons in his house. Sacic still refuses to talk. There you are. New York investigators call in Special Agent Bob Gorth from San Francisco to question Eulich. The former Oatpour member turned confidential informant accompanies him. Late in the afternoon, with the moral support of the Croatian cooperator, Julic finally begins to open up. He wanted uh, the feeling that a uh, fellow Croatian believed in him, trusted him, and he wouldn't be entirely alone. And uh, when he finally got the courage up, he said, yeah, I, I want to talk about it. And of course, that was the linchpin of the whole case. Vuka Yulic tells investigators how other Otpur members convinced him to kill a Croatian community leader in California two years earlier. After drinking all one evening and into the morning, he decided he'd strike a blow for Croatian freedom and go kill this enemy of the people. So he did. And uh, later on, he realized that what he'd done was not advancing the Croatian cause, but really was harming it. He was one of the few people that I firmly believe regretted what he did. Yulich agrees to testify against Sacic, Drevan, and the other Croatian terrorists. I killed. This is the key testimony prosecutors need to take down the entire terrorist ring. His cooperation in this case was instrumental in breaking the back of an organized crime organization, wherein in four cities we literally took out the godfathers of four families. The RICO statute, originally enacted to stop organized crime, is used for the first time to fight terrorism. Within two years, 11 members of the Otpur organization are convicted and sentenced to up to 40 years in prison. If you're going to achieve any kind of success in terrorism, you have to be able to bring to the playing field the right kind of players, the right kind of knowledge, and the right kind of resource, if you even hope to put a dent into it. The Rambo approach is not going to win over terrorists. Terrorists are motivated by the extreme sense of nationalism. And if you're going to deal with them, you've got to get into their hearts and minds. Otherwise, you may stop them on a particular incident, but you haven't changed their minds. If you don't change their minds, they'll do it again. For the FBI and law enforcement nationwide, dismantling Otpur was a vital achievement. Terrorists operating inside U.S. borders were stopped dead in their tracks. In Detroit, a brutal gang strikes again and again, targeting residents in terrifying home invasions. They attack quickly, take what they want, and leave no evidence behind. As the assaults continue, the FBI and local police join forces to stop the terror. In the end, authorities come face to face with a vicious gang that refuses to be taken alive.
1990s, neighborhoods in Detroit were terrorized by a gang of robbers. Impersonating police officers, they invaded over 100 homes, robbing, raping, and torturing their victims. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The extraordinary number and sheer magnitude of these home invasions stunned authorities. As residents feared for their lives, agents teamed up with local police to take down this sadistic gang. Detroit, Michigan, February 1994. In some neighborhoods, narcotics trafficking is a way of life, and drug busts by the local police are routine. This raid is anything but routine. <laughs> The men ask the resident where he keeps his drugs and money. He refuses to talk, confident that police officers would never hurt him. that officers broke into his home, assaulted him, then stole money and jewelry. The patrolmen know the resident is a local narcotics dealer. They also know there were no drug raids scheduled for that address. Could these home invaders be rogue cops? The incident is part of a wave of excessively violent home invasions plaguing Detroit. Averaging more than one a week, they spread fear throughout the city. The invaders leave no useful evidence behind. In June 1994, the newly formed Safe Streets Violent Crimes Task Force dedicates itself to putting an end to the terror. It is comprised of Detroit police detectives and FBI agents, including Special Agent Michael Kosanovich. We really were determined to solve these violent home invasions. Initially, we were aware of, of approximately 50 home invasion robberies from the beginning of 94 up through June of 94. They were fairly violent. They involved shootings, sexual assaults, Investigators begin by searching for connections between the numerous invasions. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. We took a look at all the police reports that were taken over the previous two or three months. Uh, we analyzed them, we broke them down into the MOs and exactly what these perpetrators were doing on each one. Investigators identify a recurring method used in the attacks, according to Special Agent Bob Pertuso. The gang used a dynamic approach that law enforcement officers use when they execute a search warrant or make an arrest to gain quick entry into a home and then take control of the occupants. They all wore uh, masks and they were all armed with semi-automatic pistols, assault rifles, MAC-10s. Based on this consistent MO, the task force suspects that a single group is committing most of the invasions. We were able to narrow this down to, yes, it was a gang of about uh, anywhere from four to eight. Uh, the descriptions all fit the same. Uh, their MO was the same. Everything was the same on almost every home invasion. To gather more first-hand information, investigators re-interview the victims of the home invasions. I understand you had some excitement here the other day. They learn that most of them are involved in narcotics trafficking. FBI Special Agent Michael Kosanovich is not surprised that dealers are reluctant to talk. They don't want to reveal the fact that they were selling drugs or conducting illegal activity out of that residence. Detective Sergeant Tom Barry tells the dealers that the task force has no interest in busting them for narcotics. People are getting raped. They're violent. We don't care about the drugs. We need your cooperation. So what's going on? About 90% of the time, 
uh, the drug guy come on board, you come on our team and say, hey, I deal my drugs, I know that's not right, um, I'll tell you what I know about this case. Pose a gun at me and I'm like, he's a cop, you know. Investigators discover that some home invasion victims are not drug dealers. These sometimes elderly people, they're, they're panicking, they're crying, they're begging. Got guns to the side of their head. Where's the dope? Where's the money? Where's the dope? Where's the money? There isn't any money. There isn't any dope. The gang has simply hit the wrong house. Realizing that there are no drugs or money, they turn violent. Did they ask you? We heard all the horrible stories of the torture, 80-year-old women, pistol whipped, hit with the butts of shotguns. FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. What really bothered us the most were the sexual assaults of the uh, females who were present on six of the home invasions. Uh, one in particular, a, a mother and her 15-year-old daughter were raped simultaneously by two members of the home invasion group. Just the look in their eyes, the fear, their anger that was very controlled but yet was all inside their body. You could just feel it with their body emotions. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The little girl, without saying it, just through her eyes, she said, please help us. Please help us. And that hit me. And that look in that girl's eyes will stay with me for the rest of my life. We told her that we would do anything in our power to bring these guys to justice. What I had to do is build their confidence up phone calls every day to let them know that I'm still thinking about them, we didn't forget about anything, and we're on your side and you're well protected and you have nothing to worry about. The fright that was in them will always be there. They knew they had the full cooperation of the Violent Crime Task Force on their side. Concerned that the home invasions are executed like a police raid, the task force confronts the possibility the gang is made up of law enforcement personnel. We checked to see any recent officers that have been fired from the job, uh, maybe were accused of uh, illegal use of narcotics, because this was all revolved around narcotics, you know. So you, you would check, you know, any ex-narcotic officers, and there was nothing. Investigators quickly recognized that the escalating level of violence in these cases indicates that law enforcement is probably not involved. In our experience, police officers aren't going to go that extra step and, and, and fire shots into a house or go rape a victim, uh, things of that nature. It's usually go in and rob, grab, go in and knock the door down, get their uh, whatever they need and run out. Uh, so it'd be, in the beginning, it, we had to look at that, but then we had to eliminate that as the, as the uh, more and more as the home invasions were occurring, uh, it got more and more violent. We realized that it wasn't police officers ex or ex-police officers. The biggest problem with these subjects acting as police when they committed these home invasions was that they jeopardized legitimate police officers. If a victim has been robbed before by this gang and then the police show up another time to execute a search warrant legitimately, they may start shooting or try to harm the police officers. So what we need to do is start going Now that investigators have a clearer idea of what they are dealing with, they begin their efforts to identify the members of the gang. We looked at a number of people who had committed these offenses in the past, um, or robbery type offenses of narcotics dealers. We contacted various informants and asked them to try and determine the identities of these individuals. However, none of the informants that we had talked to had any specific information regarding the people who were committing these offenses. A couple of hours ago. Over the next month, the home invasions continue, but the task force makes little progress. Every home invasion in the city of Detroit where people went in posing as officers, we, the Violent Crime Task Force, would respond to it. So we got first-hand information, try to get a feel, are these our guys, are these not our guys, why are they or why are they not? Investigators carefully process each scene but can find no evidence. Everything we did, we, we weren't getting lucky. We needed a break. July 26, 1994. Nearly two months after the investigation began. <coughs> the 
Detroit police respond to a call about shots fired. They find a barely conscious man with multiple gunshot wounds. He has a gun, police jacket, bulletproof vest, and a ski mask. The clothing matches descriptions of home invaders given by prior victims. Police call for an ambulance. Officers alert the task force. This could be the break they need. Here's a guy, he's got a gun on him, he's got a police vest on. And my only hope at the time was, please don't die. Please don't die. Agents rush to the hospital, hoping the man pulls through. In Detroit, a joint FBI and police task force tackles an epidemic of violent home invasions perpetrated by an elusive gang who uses police-style tactics. Authorities get a break when they find and arrest a critically wounded man who they believe is part of the ring. FBI agents go to the hospital to question the suspect. Fingerprint identification reveals that his name is Dante Garrison. FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. He was in pretty bad shape at the time, having been shot three times in the arm, the leg, and the stomach. He said he was aware of some robberies which had occurred, but he didn't want to go into specifics at that time. Special Agent Michael Kosanovich remains hopeful. We were encouraged by the situation, by our analysis of his emotional status, um, and the fact that, that we felt he's, he's probably at some point going to cooperate if we can work this right, if we can talk to him and reason with him. All right, guys. At Detroit Police Headquarters, the task force discusses strategies for persuading Garrison to cooperate. When the suspect's name comes up, Detroit officer Al Page recognizes it. He says he knows his family and had even once held Garrison when he was a baby. To Detective Sergeant Tom Berry, this is an extraordinary stroke of luck. Now, what are the odds of that? So not only did he get shot and didn't die, we got one of our officers that knows him. This couldn't be any better. I, I, this is, this Investigators is return to the hospital and Officer Page exploits his relationship with the suspect's family, hoping to cajole Garrison into cooperating. The ploy works. Garrison agrees to talk in exchange for immunity from prosecution. He admits that he is, in fact, a member of the home invasion gang and explains that his shooting was the result of an invasion that went terribly wrong. But one of the occupants of the residence had seen them said something and they had fled. They believed that they could come back and successfully commit the home invasion the next night. However, the occupants of that residence were ready and waiting for them. and defend for himself. Special Agent Bob Pertuso. And that was the difference between these criminals and law enforcement. A law enforcement officer would not leave a fellow officer shot in some backyard. <laughs> Knowing Garrison is in poor physical shape, the task force keeps the interview short. They need to keep him healthy. He was eventually moved out of the hospital and allowed to recuperate at home. Once he became capable of, of moving around without any assistance, uh, it was decided that, uh, that we should take him to an off-site location to have him uh, uh, fully debriefed. 
The FBI secretly moves Garrison to a safe house outside of Detroit. Investigators inform him of the potential consequences of cooperating with the task force, according to Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. We let him know that there is a real risk of him losing his life if these guys ever found out that he's talking with authorities about what has occurred. And he wanted protection to make sure nothing would happen to him. And naturally, we gave that protection to him and let him know his name wouldn't be brought up until the day of court. The way it worked was During correct. intensive interviews, Garrison reveals that the gang has several more members than previously suspected. As it turned out, it wasn't the same group of individuals who were committing these home invasions every time. It might be from three to ten members. And it really depended on who was available when the call went out, who could respond to commit that home invasion that evening. If they were available, they would go. And if, if they needed money, they would go. And if they didn't need money, maybe they might stay home that night. Garrison divulges that two career criminals control the gang. O.B. Carter and Andre Woods. O.B. and Andre Woods directed and determined which targets would be hit and which individuals would go on specific home invasions. Once a residence was targeted for a home invasion, O.B. Carter would page all the gang members that were gonna be involved that night. A few of the members would go out and conduct some surveillance on that location. They would try and identify residents, how many, ages. They would return back to the gang, debrief everyone, and then meet again later that night to actually conduct the home invasion. Garrison reveals that Andre Woods actually stages mock-up raids for training purposes. Andre Woods had taken the gang members to vacant houses to practice police-style raids. He said they would be familiar with techniques as far as how to make entry into the residence. They would enter just as the police would enter to secure it. Once the residents are neutralized, the gang interrogates the victims. You make a pay. According to Garrison, Woods is extremely violent. He rapes some of his victims and tortures drug dealers when they won't talk. A lot of times, if the victims would not tell them where the money or the drugs were, they would physically beat them or shoot them until they were willing to provide that information. Garrison describes one home invasion in which the gang tortured an elderly drug dealer. They put the guns to him. Where's the dope? Where's the money? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. They shot him in the leg. And he's in agonizing pain, and they're just hammering him again. And they didn't want to kill him. They wanted him to tell them where the drugs and the money was. They shot him again in the leg and said, hey, I'm effer. Where's the drugs? We know you got the drugs. We know it's here. Where's it at? Give us, give us, or you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And they shot him again. They told him where it was at. Got their money, got their drugs, and they're on their way. Once a home invasion was complete, they would return to the predetermined location. The money would be divided evenly among the members. Any valuables that someone was able to pick up, it was theirs to keep. Gang member and drug dealer Chris Allen would handle the stolen narcotics. Oh, this is prime weed. It was Chris Allen's responsibility to take those drugs out on the street sell them, get the money for those drugs, and divide it evenly among the members. It is also Alan who would suggest who to target for their home invasions. Alan provided a lot of intelligence to the gang members as far as who would be good people to rob. Based on his knowledge of their narcotics dealing, he knew that they either would have drugs or money present when the gang went in. Agents are impressed by Garrison's detailed recollection of past crimes. We knew that this was the jewel. He was the break that we needed to make a significant impact on, on all these home invasion robberies. Although Garrison's cooperation is critical to the investigation, it is unlikely that his testimony would stand up in court. 
it would just be his word against theirs, and that would not be sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these individuals were guilty of these crimes. We needed admissions from these people, or we needed to catch them in the act of committing a home invasion to be certain that they would be locked up. Authorities must hit the streets and find a way to take down this violent gang. Detroit police and the FBI work to shut down a dangerous home invasion gang. They get a major break when a gang member is found shot and begins cooperating with the investigation. Nah, man, these, nah, they wasn't like my boy. A joint FBI police task force begins using the informant's information to identify more gang members, according to Special Agent Martin Vanderfleet. A lot of them had criminal histories that matched up with what was occurring. We felt they were likely involved in this based on that. And we went out and did physical surveillance of their residences and could see that they were associating with other members of the group Although investigators have received detailed information about the gang's infrastructure from their cooperating witness, the task force needs more evidence to build their case. Authorities show photo lineups of the suspects to the gang's victims, hoping they can identify their attackers. Take your time. Detective Sergeant Tom Berry. The bad thing that we ran into is the victims could not identify them. They were in mask. Everything went by in a flash. They put them down on the floor. Um, they could not identify. Another set. The inability of witnesses to pick out their attackers hurts the case. Take your time. Special Agent Michael Kosanovich. No. We don't have enough information to conduct search warrants to make any arrests. All we have is one individual who's providing information. What we're now looking for is is additional fresh information to allow us to go further in the investigation. The task force asks a federal judge for permission to use wiretaps. If they can prove that there is an ongoing pattern of felonies by the gang, they can take down the entire organization on federal racketeering charges. And apparently he's also one who has trained a few days later, in the early morning hours of September 4th, 1994, police respond to a report of shots fired at an illegal after-hours gambling house. It is owned by Andre Woods, one of the gang's leaders. They interview witnesses and piece together what happened. At 4.30 in the morning, Andre Woods got into an argument with a few of the gamblers. It got out of hand, he didn't like, they disrespected him. Gunned him down, cold blood. Just wiped out, you know, four human lives in, in a second. He just kind of walked out. That's just the way he was. Got in his Mercedes Benz and took off. The task force provides Detroit homicide with information on Woods and his car. Homicide detectives use the information to alert law enforcement nationwide in an all-out effort to find the fugitive. Obviously, this caused us to try and speed up our efforts to obtain these wiretaps because we had had demonstrated to us the propensity for extreme violence. If Woods was willing to commit a quadruple homicide, we felt that they wouldn't be afraid to commit homicides if necessary in the commission of the home invasions. Five days after the quadruple homicide, a judge grants the task force permission to monitor the pagers of several of the gang members. They begin collecting phone numbers and discover a consistent pattern of calls between them. It shows further evidence of the gang's organization. A week later, the unimaginable happens. Fugitive Andre Woods strolls into Detroit police headquarters. Ray walked in and said, hey, I hear you guys are looking for me. Police believe Woods turned himself in because the manhunt was getting too hot. He thought it would be easier to fight the charges in court. 
FBI Special Agent Bob Bertuso is glad to have Woods off the streets. Because he was so violent, he was an enforcer for the gang, and if Woods was still out, there was a great potential for more people to get hurt. A week after Andre Woods surrenders, the task force uses the evidence from the pagers to get its first telephone wiretap on the remaining gang leader, O.B. Carter. We were hoping to be able to identify past home invasions, proceeds of those robbers, and most of all, identify future home invasions so that we could prevent them or catch these individuals in the act. The task force also places Carter under surveillance by a Detroit police crew that includes Officer Steve Miller. Guy was really surveillance conscious, so it was a pretty hard target to follow, but we were able to follow him. The information gathered through surveillance, combined with the evidence from the wiretap, gives investigators further insight into the gang's activities. We were able to start to watch their moves and start to anticipate as opposed to react. Anticipate where they were going to strike uh, and, and which members were going to be involved in the next home invasion. Monitoring phone conversations, they learn to recognize gang members' voices and code words. The gang calls their home invasions licks. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. After we kind of knew that they had just got done with a lick, they all get on the phone and start talking about it and laughing about it and telling them how much money they got out of a certain house or how many guns they got out of a certain house. Then they would talk about narcotics that they got out of the house. From these intercepted details of the crimes, Investigators are able to connect the gang to specific home invasions. They weren't very descriptive, but they were descriptive enough where we knew what they were talking about, what they got out of the house. So we were able to match that up with the reports of the, of the victims stating to us what was taken from the house at the time of the home invasion. But it is still not enough. We didn't know specifically which individuals in that group had committed the home invasions. We still needed more information and we really wanted to catch them in the act of committing a home invasion. One night, a surveillance officer is watching a home where gang members are meeting. Suddenly, an unmarked Detroit police car pulls up. Before surveillance can radio a warning, four plainclothes officers jump out and head in the direction of the gang house. Dispatch tells surveillance that the four are working on another case looking for a possible fugitive at the house next door. The officer is worried that the violent gang members yo, 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 first, don't know it. A Detroit plainclothes arrest team approaches a house unaware that a vicious gang armed with automatic weapons is in the house next door. Yo, 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 fellas, cops! Get ready. Those cops. An officer assigned to surveil the gang watches anxiously, not knowing if the gang will think the officers are coming for them and open fire. After a few tense moments, the officer is relieved to see no indication of a gang response. Go ahead, go ahead, play cards, man. Go ahead, man. Take your time. Later, the joint FBI police task force investigating the gang monitors a wiretap on a gang leader's home. Detroit Police Detective Sergeant Tom Berry learns the gang did, in fact, know the arrest team was outside. Apparently, they were getting ready to do a home invasion, and a police car pulled up. Home invaders don't know why these cops are out there. They thought they were coming after them. On the wire, what they said is that those cops would have came in here, we would have killed them, just killed them all. That made the hair on our arms stand up. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai is even more determined to get the gang off the streets as soon as possible. We started getting enough evidence on these guys via the wiretap that we decided that before somebody actually gets killed here, we need to, to do something quickly. But investigators need direct evidence of the gang committing a crime to ensure convictions under federal racketeering statutes. 
Special Agent Bob Pertuso. Okay, great. They would be in possession of their weapons. They'd be wearing their bulletproof vests. They'd be in possession of the goods that they stole. To protect innocent bystanders, investigators decide to arrest the gang after they leave a home invasion. Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. We know they're going to be. We did not want to try and arrest them while they were in the house committing a home invasion and possibly risk a hostage situation. But taking down this brutal gang will be extremely dangerous. They had attempted to kill people, rob people, sexually assaulted women. Very violent. In fact, we had developed that information that they had planned to shoot it out with the police when confronted. Very difficult situation. We know they're going to have vests on. We know they're going to have automatic weapons. There was no doubt in our minds that these people, they weren't going to just All throw right. up their hands and give up. They're going to shoot it out. You going with me out here for a minute? Because of the large number of individuals who were involved, as well as the weapons that they were carrying, they were heavily armed with AK-47s, MAC-10s, Uzis, all the dangerous weapons out there in the street. We believe that we needed to use a SWAT team to arrest these individuals. Agents meet with the SWAT commander who lays out the plan. The tactical squad responsible for making the arrests will hide inside an ambulance. With its emergency lights activated, the ambulance will approach the home invader's vehicle from behind as if it were passing. Investigators believe that since the gang will have just committed a home invasion, they will try to remain inconspicuous and pull to the side of the road. And we're going to ram them with the ambulance. The 20 SWAT guys, all dressed in SWAT gear with bulletproof vests, are going to get out and get a half moon around them. So when they start to get out of the car or the van, we got them contained. We didn't want to get into a chase. That was one of our things we didn't want. Uh, and that's why we decided to ram them, disable their vehicle. Uh, we didn't want to chase. The final component of the plan requires taking down the rest of the organization. We knew from past experience that only certain members of that group would be involved. It wouldn't be the whole group. So we had other police persons ready to make arrests at other locations for whoever was not present during that home invasion, as well as to execute six search warrants. We had hundreds of agents and police officers involved in our plans for the takedown of this group. For weeks, the task force works around the clock, monitoring wiretaps, looking for the right opportunity to spring their trap. Then, on November 9th, they hear gang members planning their next home invasion. When we intercepted conversations about a plan to do it in two days, we were at a great tactical advantage. Yes. We had our federal search warrant signed. We had the assignments to conduct the searches, and of course the tactical people were, were actually uh, going to handle the arrest. Unfortunately, gang members don't mention where the home invasion will no. be. We don't know where yet. The next day, surveillance watches two gang members drive through a neighborhood as though scouting for a potential target. The task force now believes they know approximately where the home invaders will strike. Police headquarters, November 11th. With the home invasion only hours away, the task force goes over the plan with team leaders one final time. To underscore the danger the officers face, they play a tape recording of the gang's threat to kill police. We played that tape for the people who were going to take these people down later on. This is the real deal. We're not playing with these people. These people aren't playing with you. They have no hesitation of killing a police officer. And you can just see the officers just intently staring. You know what I'm saying? This is real. These guys are going to kill us. At this point, we had been investigating this group for several months, and it was a relatively long term investigation. And I think most of us on the task force wanted to conclude it, wanted to get them arrested. So we were pretty excited. I think the adrenaline level was pretty high, and we really were expecting that this was going to be the conclusion. Uh, one way or another, we were going to get these people locked up that evening. 
SWAT gives Officer Steve Miller and the rest of the surveillance teams armor-piercing ammunition for their handguns in case the takedown becomes a gunfight. We knew these guys wore the same kind of armor we wore, you know, exact same stuff in there. And we knew that they were shooting armor-piercing rounds out of their weapons. So, you know, we had to try to at least be on level par with them. That evening, surveillance observes the home invaders traveling in two cars. They drive to the area they drove the day before. You know, Everybody's tightening up, tightening up. They drive by the house and they leave. Well, they don't do the robbery. So we're thinking, what the heck's going on? FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet follows the gang from a distance. We didn't want to get too close because we didn't want to risk these individuals seeing police in the area and possibly aborting their raid. The home invaders enter a dark alley and suddenly cut their headlights. They disappear into the darkness, making it impossible to tell whether they parked or continued through the alley. We're not panicking, but where the heck are they at? Where the heck are they at? Police cannot move in for a closer look without potentially blowing their cover. If the home invaders get away, they will be free to commit another heinous crime. The FBI and Detroit police tail a gang of violent home invaders, hoping to catch them in the act. Authorities are anxious to bring closure to a six-month investigation. Here we go. I'll be cool. Yeah, just lay just back here, cool. lay just back here. Just be cool. But when the home invaders cut their headlights, police lose them. Minutes later at the operations center, Detroit Detective Sergeant Tom Berry learns from 911 that the gang has struck again. Home invasion just happened. Six guys in masks dressed as police officers. They robbed the wrong house, got nothing out of it. We got two victims that are both almost 70 years old can't identify. Since the home invaders did not steal anything, investigators decide not to make any arrests. There's simply no evidence to tie the gang to the crime. We can't prove our case. So we sit and we wait. Agents and officers scour the area looking for the home invaders. Detroit police surveillance officer doubles back to the gang's meeting place, thinking they will return there after the invasion. When he arrives, he sees them coming out of the house, dressed in their raid clothes and getting into a van. It appears that the gang is heading out for another robbery. When gang members are dropped off at a house, Miller is right behind them. I ducked into a, a nice little parking space where I could see the front of the house and I could see the van. I adjust my mirrors, you know, and get in my surveillance mode. Finally, authorities are in position to actually see the home invaders commit a crime. So the game plan was, they do the robbery, we can't stop it. If we go in, you risk hostages. We don't want hostages, we want nobody to get hurt. Suddenly, Officer Miller notices the home invader's van creeping up behind him. My heart starts pounding, you know, I'm like, this guy saw me. I got my weapon in my hand, you know, and just in case anything happens, you know, I'm, I gotta be ready. By me. The van pulls up to the house. These guys came running out. Just all kind of stuff in their hands, and they all jumped into the van. With a confirmed invasion, the task force puts their arrest plan into motion. Now we're ready to go. Now we're going to take them down. We turn it over to the SWAT team. An ambulance loaded with SWAT personnel approaches the gang's van and attempts to disable the vehicle by ramming it. But at 
the last second, the van speeds up, and the ambulance cannot make a strong hit. The van, which has more horsepower, easily gets away from the SWAT team. FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. We obviously had a major problem. We had six highly armed individuals in a van, and we had to stop them. Surveillance teams begin pursuing the van, knowing the chase will likely end in a gun battle. FBI Special Agent Bob Pertusa. Whenever you have armed robbers running from the police, wearing bulletproof vests, armed with automatic weapons, once they broke through the attempts by the police to stop them, there was going to be a confrontation, absolutely. Officer Miller and the other pursuit vehicles continue to chase the van through the streets of Detroit. Suddenly, the van's rear doors open, and the gang begins shooting at law enforcement. A SWAT sniper inside one of the chase cars returns fire. At police headquarters, Officer Tom Dunai continues to monitor the chase. It was amazing because of what had happened how controlled the officers were in the street. There wasn't any panic, but people were screaming shots are being fired. We even heard gunfire over the radio. That's how strong it was. And in my heart, I was scared for the officers at that point. Just stay with them. The chase continues for several miles. Then, inexplicably, the van stops. Four guys bailed out the van. They're firing at me, and I jump out of my car, and I fire one shot, I get one shot off of my nine millimeter, and it jammed. Natural instinct is just, these guys aren't getting away. Let me chase these guys. SWAT officers order the remaining two home invaders to exit the van. But the van takes off, and the chase continues leaving Miller alone to pursue the heavily armed suspects. It was like I could feel the bullet going by. To this day, I can't explain to you why I didn't get shot. And I say, okay, police, we got you surrounded, come out. Miller thought other officers were following behind him. He suddenly realizes He's all alone. And it's like a ghost town. I mean, nobody there. Even worse, he does not know where his attacker has gone. The FBI and Detroit police engage in a running gun battle with a violent home invasion gang. Officer Steve Miller narrowly escapes an ambush. When backup arrives, Miller begins searching for his attacker. We start going up eastbound on Pasadena, just checking, checking. Sure enough, uh, get about five houses up, and uh, this guy is laying face down. So I'm like, you know, okay, get up, you know, get up. And, uh, you know, he, wasn't moving, kind of lifeless, so I reached around the field, you know, to see if I could get a pulse from him. He's dead. He's dead. He's later identified as O.B. Carter, the gang's leader. A subsequent autopsy concludes that Officer Miller's first shot, an armor-piercing round, punctured Carter's bulletproof vest and fatally wounded him. Miles away, the police chase comes to an abrupt end when the gang's van breaks down. The two remaining home invaders jump out of the van. One surrenders, but the other will not go down without a fight. FBI agents pursue the fleeing gunman. Searching down a dark alley, Special Agent Bob Pertuso sees a dark shape and carefully approaches. The getaway driver was lying on the ground. He had been uh, uh, shot uh, a number of times. 
the agents call for an ambulance. The getaway driver is taken to a hospital and against all odds, survives. Following a series of fierce gun battles, the task force assesses the casualties. Okay. Hundreds of shots were fired. Incredibly, no one on the arrest team was hit. Our plan worked. Unknown or injured. Did not uh, anticipate the high-speed chase and the violent confrontation, but it happened. It was dealt with uh, effectively. But only three of the six gang members involved in the chase have been apprehended. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai tries to locate them. What I had done was call local hospitals to find out if anybody was admitted with, with a gunshot wound. And we called around a few hospitals. We had a hit at one hospital, and they says, oh, yeah, somebody just came in with multiple gunshot wounds. At the hospital, Dunai confirms the gunshot victim is one of the fugitives. As the search for the remaining two gang members continues, FBI agents, the FBI SWAT team, and local police serve search warrants on six of the gang members' houses. They find critical evidence, according to FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. Well, we found a lot of evidence that had been taken from robberies, including specific items of clothing, of jewelry, and then we also recovered a great amount of weapons. A lot of the houses would have three to five guns in them, as well as ammunition, uh, vests, pry bars, masks, and other things. At Detroit Police Headquarters, Detective Sergeant Tom Berry questions the captured members of the home invasion gang. He lets them know they are facing long prison terms and that those who cooperate first may get reduced sentences. Probably 95% of them told us exactly what happened. That's how we were able to identify the rest of the gang, the rest of the peripheral players. Over the following months, the task force systematically arrests gang members. In the end, a total of 29 are convicted and sentenced on federal or state charges in the biggest home invasion prosecution to date. This particular task force, it was the first major task force between the FBI and the Detroit Police Department. We wanted to do a good job for those victims. We made a difference. We really uh, made a difference uh, to the city of Detroit. Uh, we did make it a safer place. Well, it just goes to show you that when, when law enforcement agencies can work together smoothly with the right people, anything can be accomplished. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of the Detroit Police Department and the FBI, the violent home invaders gang is dismantled forever. In Beirut, armed extremists seize a plane to make a political statement. They terrorize the crew and passengers, including two US citizens. As attacks increase against Americans abroad, the FBI and the CIA undertake a daring operation to arrest a hijacker and to send a powerful message to terrorists everywhere. In the 1980s, the United States faced a deadly new enemy abroad, an expanding network of terrorists targeting American interests. Hundreds of innocent people were killed in bombings, executions, and hijackings. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the violence escalated, the U.S. government responded with new laws, laws that gave the FBI broader powers to go after these radical extremists. This is the story of one of the FBI's first cases in the war on terrorism, a war that started long before September 11. Hi there. How are you doing today? Thank you. Yes, 
June 11, 1985. 66 passengers, including an American university professor and his son, board Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 from Beirut, Lebanon to Amman, Jordan. flight attendants to identify undercover sky marshals to prevent them from intervening. The lead hijacker forces his way into the cockpit and orders the crew to take off. Once in the air, he demands that the captain fly to Tunis. The captain does not speak Arabic. His co-pilot translates. The hijacker wants to force a meeting with the Lebanese ambassador and the chairman of the Arab League, Chadley Kalibi. The goal, to make demands, including the removal of 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon. As the plane flies toward Tunis, the terrorists beat and torture the sky marshals. They appear to have complete control until the aircraft finally enters Tunisian airspace. Former member of the FBI's International Terrorism Squad, Special Agent Tom Hansen. They were denied landing uh, authority. And in fact, uh, the Tunisian authorities blocked the runways with fuel and water trucks. The main hijacker, I had conversations over the aircraft radio with the tower. Uh, this went back and forth for an extended period of time, and he was simply unable to break the Tunisian will to allow the aircraft to land. Unable to force a meeting with Arab League chairman Chadley Kalibi, the hijacker reads his statement to the control tower. The aircraft continues to circle the Tunis airport, becoming dangerously low on fuel. The pilot convinces the lead hijacker that to avoid crashing, they must fly to Palermo, Italy to refuel. Flight 402 approaches the Italian airport, but the captain cannot land. The runways there are also blocked. He informs the air traffic control that they must either allow the plane to land or clean up the wreckage. The tower finally complies. Once they are on the ground, the hijackers demand that the plane be refueled. Airport authorities at Palermo refuse. The Italians stall for time with a simple deception. They notified the flight deck that they had, uh, they had notified the Arab League and that they were making all attempts and felt confident that they could get Chadli Kalibi to travel from Tunis to Palermo to meet with the hijackers. The hijacker is suspicious. Why would Chadli Kalibi travel to Palermo when he refused to meet him at Tunis Airport? After an hour of waiting, the hijacker tells the tower that he will throw two children from the plane if airport authorities do not send out a refueling truck. Ten minutes later, Flight 402 is refueled and heading back to Tunis. For the second time in one day, the plane circles above Tunis International Airport. The captain tells the tower that the hijacker wants to read his statement on Tunisian radio 
a state-run network. The air traffic controller responds that they cannot patch him through. They don't have the equipment. Listen, he doesn't even speak English, okay? To appease the hijacker, the captain lies to him and tells him the tower has agreed to broadcast his statement. Flight 402 returns to Beirut International Airport. Another terrorist boards the plane. He orders a few children and elderly passengers to leave. He relays a message from a superior, instructing the lead hijacker to fly over Jordan and Syria to read their proclamation. The plane again takes off. But after spending more than 24 hours in the air, the lead hijacker decides to turn back. He did not feel that they were getting a bang for their buck, so to speak. So the aircraft never went to Jordan and never went to Syria. The aircraft circles Lebanon for several hours before finally landing in Beirut. Determined to get their message across, the hijackers rig the nose of the aircraft with plastic explosives. At 9 a.m., the lead hijacker calls the tower. He vows that if 20,000 Palestinian refugees are not expelled from Lebanon by 2 o'clock that afternoon, he will kill the remaining hostages. In Beirut, gunmen rigged the cockpit of a hijacked plane with explosives. Aboard are 66 passengers, including two United States citizens and nine crew members. The hijackers tell the tower that they will kill all the hostages if the government does not expel more than 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon by 2 p.m. FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen. Without any real notice, the passengers were ordered off the aircraft and instructed to uh, enter into the terminal building. Inexplicably, their 30-hour nightmare is over. The hijackers place hand grenades around the cabin. With the aircraft emptied and in the presence of international media, the hostage takers deliver one more emphatic statement. Hello. Federal law enforcement agencies are determined to catch the hijackers. For the FBI, it is an historic moment. For the first time, they can legally pursue terrorists who have attacked Americans overseas, a power they had only recently acquired. In the early 1980s, Lebanon was a country ravaged by civil war. With the central government in shambles, Christian and Muslim militias clash, fighting for control. Beirut, once considered the Paris of the Middle East, is reduced to rubble. The situation further deteriorates, eventually forcing the US Marines to deploy to Lebanon as part of a multinational peacekeeping force. The violence only escalates. In October of 1983, a suicide bomber detonates a truck full of explosives at the Marine barracks at Beirut International Airport. The blast kills 241 US servicemen. Three seconds later, a similar bomb destroys the French Army barracks, killing 58. The bombing at the Marine barracks is the single deadliest attack on Americans overseas. Former FBI Assistant Director of the Criminal Investigation Division, Oliver Buck Revell. The uh, horrendous attack upon the Marine barracks in, in 83, uh, for a short time, really focused the attention of the American public on terrorism, but it, it always wandered off very quickly because there was not a belief of there being a sustained level of attack against the United States. 
Many Americans are unaware that several radical Shiite Muslim groups have declared a low-intensity war on the U.S. Their goal, to drive Westerners out of Lebanon. The most notorious of these groups is Hezbollah, whom U.S. intelligence agencies suspect is behind the Marine barracks bombing. The following year, terrorism continues to plague the region. Diplomacy has failed. Peacekeeping forces have proven ineffective. And the FBI only has the legal authority to monitor international terrorism. Special Agent Tom Hansen. We had no real jurisdiction to operate uh, overseas or to prosecute those who committed acts outside the borders of the continental United States. To give U.S. authorities broader international powers, Congress enacts the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. This new law allows the FBI to apply existing kidnapping and air piracy laws to crimes committed against American citizens overseas. So from that point on, any terrorist group who took an American hostage anywhere in the world, including aircraft hijackings, became the subject of an FBI investigation. The hijacking of the Royal Jordanian flight uh, violated the anti-hostage taking statute that had been passed in 1984 uh, for the very first time and it involved the FBI then initiating an investigation even though the plane had never been in the United States and it was not a U.S. carrier. There were Americans on board, they were held hostage and therefore the, st the statute was violated. Tom Hansen becomes the lead agent on the case. The actual uh, investigation regarding the hijacking of Royal Jordanian 402 uh, started off as a, a basic intelligence effort to gather as much information as possible. The FBI knows the two most active terrorist groups in Beirut are Hezbollah and the Amal Militia, another Shia faction formed during the Civil War. This here is the plane. They suspect it is the Amal Militia who is responsible for the hijacking. They control security at the Beirut airport, giving them access to the plane. Also, the hijackers' anti-Palestinian statements are typical of the group. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Ravel. There was a dichotomy between the Hezbollah and, and the Amal, and that the Amal wanted to remove the Palestinians from the south of Lebanon to um, send them back in, into Israel or elsewhere, uh, whereas Hezbollah uh, was supportive of the Palestinian movement, particularly the PLO. Both groups use extreme measures to get their message across. Three days after the hijacking of Flight 402, four Hezbollah gunmen hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Beirut. This was primarily uh, uh, an American flight. There were over 140 passengers on board, many of them American citizens. The Hezbollah made a number of demands uh, uh, in conjunction with this uh, aircraft hijacking, specifically for the release of certain uh, Hezbollah Shia prisoners, as well as certain Palestinian prisoners. Uh, demands which, of course, the United States had no control over, uh, and of course it was against U.S. policy to make concessions to terrorist organizations. The hijackers forced the TWA jet to fly back and forth between Beirut and Algiers. At each stop, they release women and children. In Beirut, the terrorists decide to prove they are serious about their demands. They kill U.S. Navy diver Robert Steedham. They executed him in cold blood, threw him out on the tarmac uh, there at Beirut International Airport, which of course enraged all of us and uh, caused us to rededicate ourselves that uh, this wouldn't stand. We would go after these people as long as it took. 39 hostages remain, all Americans. The hijackers move them off the plane and hold them at several locations around Beirut. President Ronald Reagan reacts. Terrorist, be on notice. We will fight back against you in Lebanon and elsewhere. We will fight back against your cowardly attacks on American citizens and property. Authorities consider possible diplomatic strategies. 
There were continuous meetings in the sit room at the White House. We were trying to come up with some basis to affect the release of the hostages. This was probably the most stressful circumstance during my 12 years in charge of the terrorism program. We were using every intelligence means available to us. Uh, CIA assets, technical means, intelligence from allied services, uh, through diplomatic channels. It was an all-out effort to obtain any and all information about who was holding the hostages, where they were being held, under what circumstances, and of course, uh, any information that would allow us to locate and potentially rescue the hostages. Yeah. As U.S. agencies gather intelligence, 39 American lives hang in the balance. June 1985. Hezbollah gunmen hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Lebanon. They hold 39 passengers hostage all over Beirut. The U.S. Department of State applies diplomatic pressure, trying to secure the release of the hostages. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell. We were putting uh, pressure on the Syrians, pressure on the existing Lebanese government. We were using uh, surrogates such as Egypt uh, and, and Jordan. So it was really an all-out effort to use any and everyone that might have some ability to try and bring pressure on the, the, uh, the Hezbollah to release the prisoners. Finally, President Hafez al-Assad of Syria offers to negotiate with the captors and convinces them to release all 39 hostages. President Ronald Reagan gives voice to the nation's collective sense of relief. The 39 Americans held hostage for 17 days by terrorists in Lebanon are free, safe, and at this moment, on their way to Frankfurt, Germany. They'll be home again soon. This is a moment of joy for them, for their loved ones, and for our nation. With the hostages safe, U.S. authorities turn their attention to finding the hijackers. FBI agents debrief the hostages of TWA Flight 847. Special Agent Tom Hansen. Many of the passengers were shown um, photo spreads of previous uh, suspects in hijackings, kidnappings, to determine whether or not uh, any of these individuals were involved in the TWA uh, incident. Many of the passengers identified the photo that we had of the main hijacker uh, from the Royal Jordanian aircraft. Hansen learns that the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402, a member of the Amal militia, guarded hostages from the TWA hijacking. They gave accounts of conversations with this individual who admitted that he was one of the Royal Jordanian hijackers and asked them if they had seen the aircraft and uh, basically bragged about his, his role in that incident. Investigators have identified a prosecutable subject but gathering information on a Beirut-based terrorist is difficult at best. At the time, a boundary called the Green Line divides Beirut into the Christian East and the Muslim West. Dwayne Dewey Claridge is a former division chief in the Central Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Operations. West Beirut was no man's land for Americans or even for many uh, Lebanese and Therefore, collecting information was extremely difficult, not only for, for, the, for CIA, but also for the friendly Lebanese intelligence services. But the CIA is relentless. Embedded operatives in Beirut continue interviewing informants. Their persistence pays off. They learn where the Royal Jordanian air hijacking suspect lives. The only problem U.S. authorities are powerless to go after him. It just wasn't possible to coordinate with the Lebanese authorities to hand over, hand over the main subject. There, there was no specific government really in control. Terrorism continues to spread throughout the world. In 1985 alone, there are 812 incidents of international terrorism. 926 people are killed. 
including 23 Americans. We had so many acts of terrorism committed against U.S. citizens abroad uh, that the president convened a task force, the vice president's task force on combating terrorism, brought in cabinet level people to examine the law, the policy, and the actions of the United States to best combat terrorism and to define the roles of the various agencies so that it was very clear. And they set up means for interagency coordination. In January 1986, the task force creates the Operation Subgroup, or OSG. I'd like to be meeting somewhere else under different circumstances, but terrorism. This interagency to go on. panel is comprised of officials from the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the State Department. Buck Ravel represents the FBI. The OSG had two responsibilities one, to ensure that appropriate intelligence was disseminated at, on a, a full basis. Uh, secondly, to coordinate operations against uh, terrorist targets, whether they be uh, groups or organizations or even uh, terrorist-sponsoring nations. Representing the CIA on the OSG is Dewey Claridge. Even before the creation of the OSG, Claridge had made recommendations for improving the CIA's counterterrorism operations. We had to do something very different because terrorism is a transnational phenomenon. By, what I mean by that is that an operation may be planned by a group in Syria but carried out in Rome. Now, the U.S. government, like all, all governments, is organized on geographic lines no matter what agency you're talking about. And it inhibits really getting after the terrorists. To handle that, you would create a center where the center would operate across national boundaries or across the divisional boundaries of CIA. The solution, at least for CIA, was to create the counterterrorism center to deal with a transnational problem, both in terms of geography and bureaucratic turf. The CTC unites operatives from each of the agency's divisions, enabling them to pool intelligence. Dewey Claridge is named chief of the center. It was a revolution. Never before had CIA ever organized across geographic boundaries or bureaucratic geographic boundaries on anything. This afternoon, uh, the U.S. is now in a position to take action against the terrorist threat, and the OSG is at the center of the effort. We were looking for a target which would do several things for us. One, we wanted to demonstrate to the terrorists in the Middle East that we had the will and the capability of going after them anywhere at any time. Second, we wanted to demonstrate the effectiveness of the new law and to have it tested in the courts. So we were looking for proactive opportunities to, to uh, essentially put on, on notice that the United States was not going to be dormant. It was going to be proactive in addressing these problems. Members of the OSG sift through intelligence on several wanted terrorists, including the hijackers of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 and TWA Flight 847. The problem is, none of the potential targets are accessible. That's kind of a tough place to get into, but I assure you that For now, all the CIA and the FBI can do is gather information on the wanted terrorists and work to get indictments. Special Agent Tom Hansen. As most investigations go, there, there has to be an element of luck, and ours came in, uh, in June of 1987. The OSG learns that the Drug Enforcement Agency already has a Lebanese informant working out of Cyprus. Because of his associations, they believe he could help them locate wanted terrorists. In debriefing him, a CA operative learns the informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. U.S. authorities may finally have the means to capture him. In the 1980s, with the growing threat of violence 
against Americans abroad, the U.S. government makes international terrorism a top priority. In 1986, the Operation Subgroup, or OSG, learns that a DEA informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen. Not only did he know the main hijacker, but they had shared a uh, friendship and an association over a period of approximately four years. In fact, indicated that he felt that he could get this person to travel outside of Lebanon and visit him uh, in another country. And this gave us uh, one thing that we hadn't had in the past, and that was accessibility. Former chief of the CIA's counterterrorist center and OSG member, Dewey Claridge, by getting our hands on him and bringing him back to the States and put him on trial, we would be signaling to the terrorists for the first time that we had changed our method of operation and we were on the offensive. The informant is cooperating, but he has a few concerns. I don't know the Former FBI executive assistant Buck Revell. He wanted a uh, significant uh, reward and relocation of himself and his family uh, to the United States under the Witness Protection Program. Uh, we felt uh, in, in the interagency uh, uh, negotiations that this was a reasonable request. He certainly would be at risk if he and his family stayed in Lebanon, uh, so um, we obtained authority to do that. In Cyprus, the informant tells a CIA operative that the hijacker has left the Amal militia. The hijacker, in fact, uh, got into the drug business. Uh, he pursued this in Europe and uh, other uh, parts of the uh, Mediterranean, so was somewhat actively involved in uh, transportation and sale of narcotics. He told us that the lead hijacker was interested in doing drug deals, that he had been involved in the past in certain drug operations and he thought that he could be enticed to leave Lebanon, which was an important issue, uh, and go to Cyprus or elsewhere where he would be vulnerable for arrest on our charges. The OSG now believes the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker is within reach. With the informant's cooperation, the CIA plants listening devices in his home to record his conversations with the hijacker. The determination was for him to go back and say, I know of a major international drug dealer who is looking to do an operation. Uh, you could bring the drugs in through uh, uh, Iran into Lebanon and then uh, set up an operation to supply this drug dealer, and it would be very lucrative. The plan calls for the informant to set up a meeting outside Lebanon between the hijacker and an imaginary drug dealer named Joseph. The OSG decides the meeting will take place on a yacht in international waters. We did not want any operation that we undertook to involve violations of the sovereignty of another nation. The OSG considers whether the U.S. military or the FBI should make the arrest. good news for you. She just handed me a memo. Former commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team, Special Agent David Woody Johnson, the basic plan was that any, any counterterrorism operation occurred outside the United States or its territories would be handled by the military. Anything that occurred inside the United States or its territories, HRT would handle. And so now we got a situation where we, we may want to go over and grab a guy overseas to use the military teams or to use HRT. And now it had to have been debated at the at the Attorney General Department of Defense level, and they finally described it as an arrest. So we're going to use the hostage rescue team in spite of the fact that we're going to do it overseas. They choose the HRT because the FBI has arrest powers and the military does not. Members of the HRT are law enforcement officers trained to do hostage rescue and testify in a U.S. court of law. The idea was to try to take him alive and bring him back here and prosecute him. 
So I think it, you know the idea was to make a bigger political statement. We wanted to make sure that uh, the terrorist groups and organizations, particularly terrorist sponsoring nations, knew that the United States had both legal authority and the will to carry out whatever operations were necessary. And we knew that it had to be done with interagency cooperation. This operation took a very long time to plan. We didn't want to violate the sovereignty of another nation. We did not want to undertake this and not succeed. That would send exactly the wrong message. The plan is ready to implement. The final hurdle is obtaining the president's approval. As I was going to Washington National Airport to uh, catch a commercial flight, uh, uh, under just a pa regular passport uh, to Athens. Uh, I received a telephone call uh, in the bureau vehicle uh, from Ed Meese, the Attorney General. And he uh, advised me, he said, Buck, uh, I just briefed President Reagan. It's a go. Good luck, and uh, I'll uh, talk to you on the other end. Okay, I don't keep you posted. Before launching the mission, the FBI solidifies their case. We had to recontact the uh, witnesses that we had previously uh, interviewed and determine whether or not we could get a commitment from them that they would come to the United States and testify. Several passengers and crew of Flight 402 agree to take the stand if necessary. The government now has a prosecutable case. plan, dubbed Operation Goldenrod, is set into motion. In the mid-1980s, the U.S. Congress acts to give federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies broader powers to battle the growing threat of international terrorism. September. 1987. Operation Goldenrod is a go. The FBI, the CIA, and the U.S. Navy deploy assets for the arrest of the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker. The FBI coordinates their portion of the operation from a command center aboard the USS Butte, positioned in international waters 15 miles off the coast of Cyprus. Special Agent Woody Johnson is the commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team. The crew was told that they were just waiting for technical support to come out on the ship to help them correct some problems. We came off carrying gun cases and, and other things, and we have some pretty big agents, and they don't look like normal technicians, and those don't look like normal you know, technical boxes. I remember having one of these young sailors say something the other way by, said, technicians, right. In Greece, HRT member Special Agent Don Glasser rents the yacht where the arrest will take place. What was chosen because it would blend in, it wouldn't, wouldn't attract any attention. We made some changes to it. We actually put a satellite navigation system in and making some adjust to that and put actually put a Loran on it. And um, it's an electro electronic navigation equipment. In the port town of Limassol, Cyprus, Dewey Claridge and the CIA team set up a command post in a hotel room. We had a communications officer with us and a lot of uh, aluminum trunks of equipment, which were passed off as photographic gear. And we had uh, uh, satellite communications back to Washington, to UCOM at Stuttgart, uh, that's the uh, U.S. Uh, mil military command at Stuttgart. Uh, and we, of course, we had communications with the Butte, with the, with the yacht, and uh, headquarters was patching uh, our communications through to the FBI headquarters, the White House, and whoever else. Everybody wanted to be in on this, uh, know what was going on. Under sail off the coast of Greece, the FBI arrest team alters the appearance of the yacht to protect the owner's identity. We changed the flag from a Grecian flag to a uh, to, to Italian flag. We changed the home port and the name on the hull. 
and we turned the uh, life preservers all around, which had the day of the boat on it. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell oversees the Bureau's command center on the USS Butte. We had uh, uh, emergency response team. We had a uh, helicopter turning up on the uh, deck, on the aft deck, ready to immediately respond with uh, uh, automatic weapons and uh, other capabilities to defend against any uh, attempt by pirates or terrorist groups to intercede in the operation. Our concerns uh, over the actual execution were uh, that we could get him uh, to the location in international waters to ex execute the arrest, but also that we could secure that arrest and that we could keep it from becoming uh, an international incident. In these type circumstances, you never know exactly what you're going to be faced with. We were dealing with a very fluid situation in Lebanon. We had to have the CIA operations in place uh, in, in Cyprus. We had to have the FBI operations in place on board the yacht, which was the intercept vessel, okay, and our, our command and control and emergency response on board the USS Butte, which was going to have to stay in international waters, but be very close by. And since we couldn't control the exact timetable, it had to be very flexible. The FBI and the CIA are ready. CIA operatives tell the informant to call the hijacker in Beirut and tell him everything is in place. He needs to come to Cyprus now to meet the fictitious drug dealer, Joseph. The hijacker bought into this idea of uh, coming to Cyprus to meet uh, Joseph, who we, uh, you know, who we, um, you know, basically manufactured as a, as a big drug person. Hijacking aircraft isn't, you know, doesn't really make you much money, if any. But, uh, and so he was looking to make some money. The hijacker arrives at the informant's home, where he will stay until the operation begins. We made sure that not only did he throw money around, uh, quite lavishly when he brought uh, the hijacker over to Cyprus, but he had uh, showed him a suitcase uh, uh, full of money uh, that uh, certainly impressed the hijacker. He got the hijacker to uh, state on tape that he indeed was the chief hijacker of the Jordanian aircraft. This is something Justice Department wanted very much. The good news was that uh, the target, the hijacker, was in, on Cyprus, on schedule. But the bad news was that we had learned that the Cypriot police were looking for him because somehow he had gotten on a watch list of undesirables. Um, our never was uh, running around Cyprus with a warrant on him. Operatives cannot afford to have local police arrest the hijacker in the middle of the operation. The CIA decides to have the informant move himself and the hijacker into the same hotel where they have the command center set up. I felt we could take that risk because it was a weekend. And it was unlikely that the police would energize themselves uh, to run around, particularly to a high-class hotel and a new one at that, searching for this fellow. Sunday morning, the informant tells the hijacker it's time to meet Joseph. He explains that since the drug dealer can't come to Cyprus, they need to meet him aboard his yacht. The informant's brother will take them to him in his boat. We had to have, quote, American eyes, U.S. eyes on the target, on the hijacker, when he boarded the boat to be to be able to tell Washington with absolute certainty that it was the target who was boarding the boat. And so one of our offices was located on the pier. Special Agent Tom Hansen. The uh, boat departed uh, with a cooperating witness and the main subject on time and headed out towards the yacht. We informed everybody 
on the uh, communications net of that fact and that the operation was underway. Um, we all, that also, uh, we asked for Washington to begin to implement the extraction of his relatives uh, and near relatives, sisters, brothers, and children from various places around the Middle East, which had been part of the deal. Yeah. All right. We had a picket boat system in place to act as guideposts for the for the uh, cooperating witness to navigate from. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. My job is to worry about the people that are, that are working for me, and it's the concern that this is a double cross. Have they set us up? Is he, you know, going along with this thing, but they, they're sitting in a boat somewhere waiting on us, and then they're going to come charging in on us in the yacht, and we're going to end up in a, in a fight on the water. For now, all the FBI can do is wait. Undercover FBI agents await the arrival of the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker in international waters 12 miles off the coast of Cyprus. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. We pre-positioned the HRT guys on the deck, you know, openly there with the appearance that we're bodyguards for, for the drug dealer. Get that fender ready to go over. Also on deck are two female FBI agents to act as diversions and help put the hijacker at ease. The rest of us were secreted in the down below deck with a sniper in the pilot house. In the event somebody shows up that, that we didn't expect, or that these guys suddenly jump up and have you know, got weapons and start shooting, uh, we can defend ourselves. Special Agent Don Glasser. So everything looked uh, normal in our boat. The, uh, the female agents were waving to him, beckoning him to come aboard the boat. I keep thinking this, is, this seems to be too easy. Is, is this guy, have they set us up? The undercover agent um, spoke to them in Arab, Arabic, told them that uh, the boss was um, down below in the boat taking a shower and be up shortly. We said, well, the owner's going to want the uh, want him to be searched for weapons. It would only take a second. We apologized for that, but that was business, and uh, he didn't resist that. So uh, the other uh, other agent patted him down, gave him a quick pat down for weapons. Didn't find anything on him. Clean. The other agent escorted him back. To the uh, cockpit area where we uh, he nodded to me which was the signal that we'd execute the arrest the HRT operators came up from the cabin he was very surprised I'm not sure who he thought we were he was absolutely terrified did not resist us we put leg irons on him and we called the ship agents send word of the successful arrest all right we're out of here uh, at that point, we knew that, you know, we'd done what we were supposed to do, deliver the target to the Bureau, and so we closed down the, uh, the uh, command post very rapidly, checked out of the hotel. As soon as the arrest was made, uh, we launched a, uh, a boat from the Butte. Butte is 900 foot in ship, so we're talking big. Comes up over the horizon and we came up alongside of it. And the captain was, was playing patriotic music over the loudspeaker. You could hear it. Mm -hmm. And he was flying a huge American flag off the back of it. At that point, he's, in, he's telling the crew what's going on. He said, you know, we finally were striking back. And you had the opportunity to be a part of it. i tell you one of the things that was, it was really a thrill and, and uh, actually kind of choked me up is when we came up on the deck, the, the, Probably two, three hundred of the crew were up on the deck, and they were cheering and clapping. And it just really was a kind of emotional experience. 
the Butte immediately headed west in the Mediterranean to link up with the aircraft carrier USS Saratoga. Agents interview the hijacker aboard the Butte. The debriefing of, of uh, the terrorists was very helpful to the U.S. Uh, intelligence community and getting an overall appreciation and understanding of the dynamics of uh, circumstances in, in South Lebanon, the relationship uh, between the Amal and, and the Hezbollah and, and the Lebanese government, uh, and also uh, the involvement of both Syria uh, and Iran in that area. We uh, transported him to the Saratoga uh, aboard military helicopter. From there, FBI agents transfer the hijacker to an S-3 Viking for the long trip to the United States. During its uh, trip uh, back to Washington, D.C., it uh, had to perform two in-air refuelings. Uh, once the, once the flight was completed, it, it represented the longest uh, flight from, continuous flight from the uh, uh, deck of a U.S. carrier uh, that the military had ever performed. After a 13-hour flight, the S-3 lands at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. The Flight 402 hijacker is immediately taken to Washington, D.C. for arraignment. In 1989, the hijacker is tried, convicted, and sentenced to 30 years in prison for conspiracy, air piracy, and hostage taking. The uh, arrest and prosecution was the, the first instance of US law bringing an individual into custody overseas, bringing him to the United States and prosecuting him in federal court for a crime in which neither he nor the victim uh, nor, nor the uh, act or circumstance ever touched US territory. It was our hope that by carrying out such an audacious uh, act that we would send a very strong signal to the terrorists that uh, the, the game had changed, that uh, we would no longer uh, be essentially passive, but we'd be proactive in pursuing uh, them across the entire world if necessary. Operation Golden Rock was the first success of its kind in the U.S. government's new war 